Hey, we're back. The Last Unicorn. The reading continues. <clears throat> Thanks for bearing with me. It took me a little while to carve out a little bit of time. We had a couple of setbacks on the, the content front and stuff, but we're going to see this story through. Forgive me. <clears throat> Starting with a little throat clear here. But we do this all in one take, just like anybody who would sit with you reading a book to you would do, right? They don't, they don't edit. Uh, occasionally, there's a little pause for commentary or reactions, which I try to keep to a minimum. But I am only human, and I do love the content. I do like uh, interacting with you folks. So let's continue with Chapter 8, then, with all that said, and find out what happens now that uh, the crew we've been following has uh, has been pursued by the citizens of Hagsgate, who are trying to stop them from reaching Haggard's castle. And also the Red Bull has just shown up to to break up sort of that pursuit. So this is about the Red Bull. He was the color of blood. Not the springing blood of the heart, but the blood that stirs under an old wound that never really healed. A terrible light poured from him like sweat, and his roar started landslides flowing into one another. His horns were as pale as scars. For one moment, the unicorn faced him, frozen as a wave about to break. Then the light of her horn went out, and she turned and fled. The red bull bellowed again and leaped down after her. The unicorn had never been afraid of anything. She was immortal, but she could be killed by a harpy, by a dragon, or a chimera, by a stray arrow loosed at a squirrel. But dragons could only kill her. They could never make her forget what she was, or themselves forget that even dead, she would still be more beautiful than they. The Red Bull did not know her, and yet she could feel that it was herself he sought, and no white mare. Fear blew her dark then, and she ran away, while the bull's raging ignorance filled the sky and spilled over into the valley. The trees lunged at her, and she veered wildly among them. She who slipped so softly through eternity without bumping into anything. Behind her, they were breaking like glass in the rush of the Red Bull. She roared once again. Oh, he roared once again. And a great branch clubbed her on the shoulder so hard that she staggered and fell. She was up immediately, but now roots humped under her feet as she ran, and others burrowed as busily as moles to cut across the path. Vines struck at her like strangling snakes. Creepers wove webs between the trees. Dead boughs crashed all around her. She fell a second time. The bull's hooves on the earth boomed through her bones, and she cried out. She must have found some way out of the trees, for she was running on the hard, bald plain that lay beyond the prosperous pasture lands of Hagsgate. Now she had room to race, and a unicorn is only loping when she leaves the hunter kicking his burst and sinking horse. She moved with the speed of life, winking from one body to another or running down a sword, swifter than anything burdened with legs or wings. Yet, without looking back, she knew that the red bull was gaining on her, coming... <clears throat> excuse me. Coming like the moon, the sudden swollen hunter's moon, she could feel the shock of the livid horns in her side, as though she had, although as though he had already struck. Ripe, sharp cornstalks leaned together to make a hedge at her breast, but she trampled them down. Si silver wheat fields turned cold and gummy when the bull breathed on them. They dragged at her legs like snow. Still, she ran, bleating and defeated, hearing. The butterflies icy chiming. They passed down all the roads long ago, and the red bull ran close behind them. He had killed them all. Suddenly the bull was facing her, as though he had been lifted like a chess piece, swooped through the air, and set down again to bar her way. He did not charge immediately, and she did not run. He had been huge when she first fled him, but in the pursuit he had grown so vast that she could not imagine all of him. Now he seemed to curve with the curve of the bloodshot sky, his legs like great whirlwinds, his head rolling like the northern lights. 
His nostrils wrinkled and rumbled as he searched for her, and the unicorn realized that the red bull was blind. If he had rushed her then, she would not have met him, tiny and despairing with her darkened horn, even though he stamped her to pieces. He was swifter than she, better to face him now than to be caught running. But the bull advanced slowly, with a kind of sinister daintiness, as though he were trying not to frighten her. And again, she broke before him. With a low, sad cry, she whirled and ran back the way she had come, back through the tattered fields and over the plain, toward King Haggard's castle, dark and hunched as ever. And the Red Bull went after her, following her fear. Smendrick and Molly had been spun away like chips when the bull went by. Molly slammed breathless and witless against the ground, and the magician hurled into a tangle of thorns that cost him half his cloak and an eighth of his skin. They got up when they could and went limping in pursuit, leaning on one another. Neither one said a word. The way through the trees was easier for them than the unicorn had found it, for the red bull had been there since. Molly and the magician scrambled over the tree trunks, not only smashed, but trodden halfway to the ground, and dropped to hands and knees to crawl around crevasses that they could not fathom in the dark. No hooves could have made these, Molly thought dazedly. The earth had torn itself shrinking from the burden of the bull. She thought of the unicorn, and her heart paled. When they came out on the plain, they saw her, far and faint, a tuft of white on the wind, almost invisible in the glare of the red bull. Molly grew, a little crazy with weariness and fear, saw them moving the way stars and stones move through space, forever falling, forever following, forever alone. The red bull would never catch the unicorn, not until now caught up with new, bygone, and begin. Those are all in caps like as concepts. Molly smiled serenely, but the blazing shadow loomed over the unicorn until the bull seemed to be all around her. She reared, swerved, and sprang away in another direction, only to meet the bull there, his head lowered and his jaws drooling thunder. Again she turned, and again, backing and sidling, making crafty little dashes to this side or that, and each time the red bull headed her off by standing still. He did not attack, but he left her no way to go, save one. He's driving her, Smendrick said quietly. If he wanted to kill her, he could have done it by now. He's driving her the way he drove the others, to the castle, to Haggard. I wonder why. Molly said, do something. Her voice was strangely calm and casual, and the magician answered her in the same tone. There is nothing I can do. The unicorn fled once more, pitifully tireless, and the red bull let her have room to run, but none to turn. When she faced him for a third time, she was close enough for Molly to see her hind legs shivering like those of a frightened dog. Oh, so sad to picture, right? Now she set herself to stand, pawing the ground wickedly and laying back her small, lean ears. But she could make no sound, and her horn did not grow bright again. She cowered when the red bull's bellow made the sky ripple and crack, and yet she did not back away. Please, Molly Grew said, please do something. Smendrick turned on her, and his face was wild with helplessness. What should I do? What can I do with my magic? Hat tricks? Penny tricks? Or the one where I scramble stones to make an omelet? Would that entertain the Red Bull, do you think? Or shall I try the trick with the singing oranges? I'll try whatever you suggest, for I would certainly be happy to be of some practical use. Molly did not answer him. The bull came on, and the unicorn crouched lower, and lower, until she seemed about to snap in two. Smendrick said, I know, what I, I know what to do. If I could, I'd change her into some other creature, some beast too humble for the bull to be concerned with. 
but only a great magician, a wizard like Nikos, who was my teacher, would have that kind of power. To transform a unicorn? Anyone who could do that could juggle the seasons and shuffle years like playing cards. And I have no more power than you have. Less, for you can touch her, and I cannot. Then suddenly he said, Look, it is over. The unicorn was standing very still before the red bull, her head down and her whiteness drabbled to a soapy gray. She looked gaunt and small, and even Molly, who loved her, could not keep from seeing that a unicorn is an absurd animal when the shining has gone out of her. Tail like a lion's tail, deer legs, goat feet, the mane cold and fine as foam over my hand, the charred horn, the eyes, oh, the eyes. Molly took hold of Smendrick's arm and dug her nails into it as hard as she could. You have magic, she said. She heard her own voice as deep and clear as Sybil's. Maybe you can find it, but it's there. You called up Robin Hood, and there is no Robin Hood, but he came, and he was real, and that is magic. You have all the power you need, if you dare to look for it. Smendrick regarded her, in silence, staring as hard as though his green eyes were beginning the search for his magic in Molly Grew's eyes. The bull stepped lightly towards the unicorn, no longer pursuing, but commanding her with the weight of his presence, and she moved ahead of him, docile, obedient. He followed like a sheepdog, guiding her in the direction of King Haggard's jagged tower and the sea. Oh, please, Molly's voice was crumbling now. Please, it's not fair. It can't be happening. He'll drive her to Haggard, and no one will ever see her again. No one. Please, you're a magician. You won't let him. Her fingers struck even deeper into Smendrick's arm. Do something, she wept. Don't let him. Do something. Smendrick was prying futilely at her clenched fingers. I'm not going to do a damn thing, he said through his teeth, until you let go of my arm. Oh, Molly said, I'm sorry. You can cut off the circulation like that, you know, the magician said severely. He rubbed his arm and took a few steps forward into the path of the red bull. There he stood with his arms folded and his head high, though it drooped now and then because he was very tired. Maybe this, no, maybe this time, Molly heard him mutter. Maybe this time. Nico said, oh, what was it that Nico said? I don't remember. It's been so long. There was an odd, old sorrow in his voice that Molly had never heard before. Then a gaiety leaped up like a flame as he said, Well, who knows? Who knows? If this is not the time, perhaps I can make it so. There's this much of comfort, friend Smendrick. For once, I don't see how you can possibly make things any worse than they already are. And he laughed softly. The Red Bull, being blind, took no notice of the tall figure in the road until he was almost upon it. Then he halted, sniffing the air, storm stirring in his throat, but a certain confusion showing in the swing of his great head. The unicorn stopped when he stopped, and Smendrick's breath broke to see her so tractable. Run, he called to her, run now! But she looked at him, or back at the bull, or at anything but the ground. At the sound of Smendrick's voice, the bull's rumble grew louder and more menacing. He seemed eager to be out of the valley with the unicorn, and the magician thought he knew why. Beyond the towering brightness of the red bull, he could see two or three sallow stars and a cautious hint of a warmer light. Dawn was near. He doesn't care for daylight, Smendrick said to himself. That's worth knowing. Once more, he shouted to the unicorn to fly, but his only answer came in the form of a roar, like a drum roll. The unicorn bolted forward, and Smendrick had to spring out of her way, or she would have run him down. Close behind her came the bull, driving her swiftly now as the wind drives the thin, torn mist. 
the power of his passage, picked Smendrick up and dropped him elsewhere, tumbling and rolling to keep from being trampled, his eyes jarred blind and his head full of flames. He thought he heard Molly Grew scream. Scrabbling to one knee, he saw that the Red Bull had herded the unicorn almost to the beginning of the trees. If she could only try one more time to escape. But she was the Red Bull's and not her own. The magician had one glimpse of her pale and lost between the pale horns before the, re the wild red shoulders surged across his sight. Then, swaying and sick and beaten, he closed his eyes and let his hopelessness march through him until something woke somewhere that had wakened in him once before. He cried aloud for fear and joy. What words the magic spoke the second time, he never knew, surely. They left him like eagles, and he let them go. And when, they la and when the last one was away, the emptiness rushed back with a thunderclap that threw him on his face. It happened as quickly as that. This time he knew before he picked himself up that the power had been and gone. Powerful, powerful writing and statement there. That's page 142, for those of you who might want to reference this for any work you're doing on this book. Ahead, the Red Bull was standing still, nosing at something in the ground. Smendrick could not see the unicorn. He went forward as fast as he could, but it was Molly who drew enough near to see that the bull was sniffing. She put her fingers in her mouth like a child. At the feet of the Red Bull, there lay a young girl spilled into a very small heap of light and shadow. She was naked, and her skin was the clear color of snow by moonlight. Fine, tingled, tangled hair, white as a waterfall, came down almost to the small of her back. Her face was hidden in her arms. Oh, Molly said, oh, what have you done? And heedless of any danger, she ran to the girl and knelt beside her. The red bull raised his huge, blind head and swung it slowly in Smendrick's direction. He seemed to be wanning and fading as the gray sky grew light, though he still smoldered as savagely bright as crawling lava. The magician wondered what his true size was and his color when he was left alone. Oh, when he was alone. Once more, the Red Bull sniffled at the still form, stirring it with his freezing breath. Then, without a sound, he bounded away into the trees and was gone from sight in three gigantic strides. Smendrick had a last vision of him as he gained the rim of the valley. No shape at all, but a swirling darkness. The red darkness you see when you close your eyes in pain. Another awesome sort of metaphor there. The horns had become the two sharpest towers of old King Haggard's crazy castle. Molly Grew had taken the white girl's head into her lap and was whispering over and over, What have you done? The girl's face, quiet and sleep and close to smiling, was the most beautiful that Smendrick had ever seen. It hurt him and warmed him at the same time, Molly smoothed the strange hair, and Smendrick noticed on the forehead, above and between the closed eyes, a small raised mark, darker than the rest of the skin. It was neither a scar nor a bruise. It looked like a flower. "'What do you mean, what have I done?' he demanded of the moaning Molly. "'Only saved her from the bull by magic. That's what I've done.' by magic, woman, by my own true magic. Now he was helpless with delight, for he wanted to dance and he wanted to be still. He shook with shouting and speeches, and yet there was nothing that he wanted to say. He ended by laughing foolishly, hugging himself until he gasped and sprawling down beside Molly as his legs let go. Give me your cloak, Molly said. The magician beamed at her, blinking. She reached over and ungently pulled the shredded cloak from his shoulders. When she wrapped it around the sleeping girl as much as it would wrap, then she wrapped it around the sleeping girl as much as it would wrap. The girl shone through it like the sun through leaves. 
Doubtless you are wondering how I plan to return her to the proper shape, Smendrick offered. Wonder not. The power will come to me when I need it. I know that much now. One day it will come when I call, but that time is not yet. Impulsively, he seized Molly Grew, hugging her head in his long arms. But you were right, he cried. You were right. It is there and it is mine. Molly pulled away from him, one cheek roughed red and both ears mashed. The girl sighed in her lap, ceased to smile, turned her face from the sunrise. Molly said, Smendrick, you poor man, you magician, don't you see? See what? There's nothing to see. But his voice was suddenly hard and wary, and the green eyes were beginning to be frightened. The Red Bull came for a unicorn, so she had to become something else. You begged me to change her. What is it frets you now? Molly shook her head in the wavering way of an old woman. She said, I didn't know you meant to turn her into a human girl. You would have done better. She did not finish, but looked away from him. One hand continued to stroke the white girl's hair. The magic chose the shape, not I, Smendrick answered. A montebank, a montebank may select this cheat or that, but a magician is a porter, a donkey carrying his master where he must. A magician calls, but the magic chooses. If it changes a unicorn to be a, to a human being, then that was the only thing to do. His face was fevered with an ardent delirium which made him look even younger. I am a bearer, he sang. I am a dwelling. I am a messenger. You are an idiot, Molly Grew said fiercely. Do you hear me? You're a magician, all right, but you're a stupid magician. But the girl was trying to wake, her hands opening and closing, and her eyelids beating like birds' breasts. As Molly and Smendrick looked on, the girl made a soft sound and opened her eyes. They were a farther apart than common and somewhat deeper set, and they were as dark as the deep sea and illuminated, like the sea, by, a stra by strange glimmering creatures that never rise to the surface. The unicorn could have been transformed into a lizard, Molly thought, or into a shark, a snail, a goose, and somehow still her eyes would have given the change away. To me, anyway, I would know. The girl lay without moving, her eyes finding herself in Molly's eyes and in Smendrick's, then, in one motion, she was on her feet, the black cloak falling across Molly's lap. For a moment, she turned in a circle, staring at her hands, which she held high and useless, close to her breast. She bobbed and shambled like an ape doing a trick, and her face was the silly, bewildered face of a joker's victim. And yet she could make no move that was not beautiful. Her trapped terror was more lovely than any joy that Molly had ever seen, and that was the most terrible thing about it. Donkey, Molly said. Messenger. I can change her back, the magician answered hoarsely. Don't worry about it. I can change her back. Shining in the sun, the white girl hobbled to and fro on her strong, young legs. She stumbled suddenly and fell. And it was a bad fall because she did not know how to catch herself with her hands. Molly flew to her, but the girl crouched on the ground, staring, and spoke in a low voice. What have you done to me? Molly grew, began to cry. Smendrick came forward, his face cold and wet, but his voice level. I turned you into a human being to save you from the Red Bull. There was nothing else I could do. I will turn you to yourself again as soon as I can. The Red Bull, the girl whispered. Ah! She was trembling wildly as though something were shaking and hammering at her skin from within. He was too strong, she said. Too strong. There was no end to his strength and no beginning. He is older than I. Her eyes widened, and she seemed to Molly that the bull moved in them, crossing their depths like a flaming fish and vanishing. The girl began to touch her face timidly, recoiling from the feel of her own features. 
Her curled fingers brushed the mark on her forehead. She closed her eyes and gave a thin, stabbing howl of loss and weariness and utter despair. "'What have you done to me?' she cried. "'I will die here!' She tore at the smooth body, and blood flowed, followed her fingers. I will die here! I will die! Yet there was no fear in her face, though it ramped in her voice, in her hands and feet, in the white hair that fell down over her new body. She remained, her face remained quiet and untroubled. Molly huddled over her, as near as she dared, begging her not to hurt herself. But Smendrick said, be still. And the two words cracked like autumn branches. He said, The magic knew what to do. Magic knew what it was doing. Be still and listen. Why did you not let the red, let the bull kill me? The white girl moaned. Why did you not leave me to the harpy? That would have been kinder than closing me in this cage. The magician winced, remembering Molly Grew's mocking accusation but he spoke with a desperate calmness. In the first place, it's quite an attractive shape, he said. You couldn't have done much better and still remained human. She looked at herself, sideways at her shoulders and along her arms, and then down her scratched and welting body. She stood on one foot to inspect the soul of the other, cocked her eyes up to see the silver brows, squinted down her cheeks to catch a flash of her nose, and even peered closely at the sea-green veins inside her wrists, themselves as gaily made as young otters. At last she turned her face to the magician, and again he caught his breath. I have made magic, he thought, but sorrow winked sharp in his throat, like a fish, like a fish hook setting fast. All right, he said, it would make no difference to you if I changed you into a rhinoceros, which is where the whole silly myth got started. But in this guise, you have some chance of reaching King Haggard and finding out what has become of your people. As a unicorn, you would only suffer their fate, unless you think you could defeat the bull if you met, a sec met him a second time. The white girl shook her head. No, she answered. Never. Another time I would not stand so long. Her voice was too soft, as though its bones had been broken. She said, My people are gone, and I will follow them soon, whatever shape you trap me in. But I would have chosen any other than this for my prison. A rhinoceros is as ugly as a human being, and it, is, and it too is going to die, but at least it never thinks that it is beautiful. No, it never thinks that, the magician agreed. That's why it goes on being a rhinoceros and will never be welcome even at Haggard's court. But a young girl, a girl to whom it can never mean anything that she is not a rhinoceros. Such a girl, while the king and his sons seek to solve her, might unravel her own riddle until she comes to its end. Rhinoceri are not questing beasts, but young girls are. Another great line. 149, page 149. The sky was hot and curdled. The sun had already melted into a lion-colored puddle. And the plain of, the ha of Hag's Gate, and on the plain of Hag's Gate, nothing stirred but the stale, heavy wind. The naked girl with the flower mark on her forehead stared silently at the green-eyed man, and the woman watched them both. In the tawny morning, King Haggard's castle seemed neither dark nor accursed, but merely grimy run down, and poorly designed. Its skinny spires looked nothing like a bull's horns, but rather like those on a jester's cap, or like the horns of a dilemma, Smendrick thought. They never have, just two. The white girl said, I am myself still. This body is dying. I can feel it rotting all around me. How can anything that is going to die be real? How can it be truly beautiful? Molly Grew put the magician's cloak around her shoulders again, not for modesty or seemliness, but out of a strange pity, as though to keep her from seeing herself. "'I will tell you a story,' Smendrick said. "'As a child, I was apprenticed to the mightiest magician of all, the great Nikos, whom I have spoken of before. 
But even Nikos, who turns cats into cattle, snowflakes into snowdrops, and unicorns into men, could not change me into so much as a carnival sharp, card sharp. At last he said to me, My son, your ineptitude is so vast, your incompetence so profound, that I am certain you are inhabited by greater power than I have ever known. Unfortunately, it seems to be working backward at the moment, and even I can't find a way to set it right. It must be that you are meant to find your own way, to reach your power in time. But frankly, you should live so long that... But frankly, you should live so long as that will take you. Therefore, I grant it that you shall not age from this day forth, but will travel the world round and round, eternally inefficient, until at last you come to, you, to yourself and know what you are. Don't thank me. I tremble at your doom. The white girl regarded him out of the unicorn's clear, amaranthine eyes, gentle and frightening in the unused face. But she said nothing. It was Molly Grew who asked, And what if you should find your magic? What then? Then the spell will be broken, and I will begin to die as I began at my birth. Even the greatest wizards grow old, like other men, and die. He swayed and nodded and then snapped awake. Whoops, I acted that out too much. I have to find my place again. A tall, thin, shabby man smelling of dust and drink. I told you that when I was I told you that I was older than I look, he said. I was born mortal, and I've been immortal for a long, foolish time. And one day... I will be mortal again. So I know something that a unicorn cannot know. Whatever can die is beautiful, more beautiful than a unicorn, who lives forever, and who is the most beautiful creature in the world. Do you understand me? No, she said. The magician smiled wearily. You will. You're in the story with the rest of us now, and you must go with it, whether you will or no. If you want to find your... Oh, whoops. Oh, no. So it was the unicorn who said no. She didn't follow him. If you want to find your people, if you want to become a unicorn again, then you must follow the fairy tale to Haggard's castle and whatever else it chooses to take and wherever else it chooses to take you. The story cannot end without the princess. The white girl said, I will not go. She stepped away, her body wary and cold hair falling down. She said, I am no princess, no mortal, and I will not go. Nothing but evil has happened to me since I left my forest, and nothing but evil can become of the unicorns in this country. Give me my true shape again, and I will return to my trees, to my pool, to my own place. Your tail has no power over me. I am a unicorn. I am the last unicorn. Had she said that once before, long ago, in the blue-green silence of the trees? Smendra continued to smile, but Molly Grew said, Change her back. You said you could change her. Let her go home. I cannot, the magician answered. I told you. The magic is not mine to command. Not yet. That is why I too must go on to the castle, and the fate or fortune that waits there. If I tried to undo the transformation now, I might actually turn her into a rhinoceros. That would be the best thing that could happen. As for the worst... He shivered and fell silent. The girl turned from them and looked away at the castle that stooped over the valley. She could see no movement at any window or among the tottering turrets or any sign of the Red Bull. Yet she knew that he was there, brooding at the castle's roots till night should fall again, strong beyond strength, invincible as the night itself. For a second time she touched the place on her forehead, where her horn had been. When she turned again, they were asleep where they sat, the man and the woman. Their heads were pillowed on air, their mouths hung open. She stood by them, watching them breathe, one hand holding the black cloak, coat, <laughs> one hand holding the black cloak closed at her throat. Very faintly, for the first time, the smell of the sea came to her. That's the last sentence of the chapter. 
I don't know if you've noticed, I seem to, it's, I don't know if it's a curse, like stumble on the last sentences of these chapters, man. And I see it coming. I try my best and ugh, I don't know. Interesting chapter, right? Real face off with the Red Bull. Some of that scenery, I think I remember being captured pretty well in the, uh, the animated film that came out uh, the, uh, based on the book. But there was some stuff there. Um, uh, Smendrick talking about himself being immortal and things like that. And uh, the wizard Nikos, which were not in the movie itself. I don't think the movie missed having those pieces in there. But it, again, what I'm really enjoying since I grew up watching the movie, I know many of you folks watching did as well, is to feel those pieces kind of uh, filled in. And again, other folks have remarked on this in the comments. There is really this clever sort of tongue-in-cheek sort of irreverent aspect to the writing here that kind of, it's almost like a little bit of a, a slight satire on the whole fantasy genre, especially with the dialogue of uh, Smendrick, right? Have you noticed that? Um, but I enjoy it. I think it makes it actually not so heavy. It's like a real heavy kind of, you know, Red Bull, dark skies. Uh. But, you know, you kind of get this little comedy relief that's been sewn in here in a rather unique way. I haven't quite read dialogue quite like this in other fantasy books that I've read here uh, or put on the channel. So let me know what you think if you're following along. Uh, appreciate everybody's patience as we carved out time to, to get this done. And uh, I will see you on chapter nine.